pleasure to to welcome you to this timely and important webinar on sextortion and land governance, which is being co-hosted by the Land Portal, Mokoro, and Transparency International. Uh, thank you for joining us today. My name is Farai Mutondoro. I'm the Senior Researcher and Programs Coordinator with Transparency International Zimbabwe. It is my distinct honor to moderate this forum. Our discussion today is on sextortion and land governance. In the context of such a discussion, we are defining sextortion as the abuse of power to obtain a sexual benefit or advantage. Sextortion is thus a form of corruption where sex and sexual benefits are the currency at hand rather than money. This form of corruption has gone on for years and reported due to a number of structural factors. In an attempt to address sextortion in the land sector, we're going to be having this web webinar discussion on sextortion and land governance. Today we're going to discuss on sextortion and land governance. And to help us understand that, we seek to answer some of these questions. What does sextortion mean? And how is it relevant to land governance? What are the primary challenges to discussing and addressing sextortion? And more importantly, how can sextortion be tackled? What is needed to bring sextortion higher on the agenda of land governance and within the anti-corruption communities? Allow me then to introduce you to our esteemed panelists. With us today, we have Marwa Fatafa, who is the regional advisor for the Middle East and North Africa under Transparency International. We have Elizabeth Daly, who is with the, which she is a principal consultant with Mokoro LTD. We have Amani Mustafa Minda, who is the founder and executive director of Aki Madin. Lastly, we have Muchaneta Mundopa, who is the executive director of Transparency International Zimbabwe. I'll begin by posing three questions to our panelists. This will be then be followed by a round of discussion, after which I'll open up discussion to the audience. In that regard, I want to encourage attendees to share some of your questions you might be having through the webinar system. If you have any questions that come to mind as panelists speak, please not hesitate to write them down. Let me now first ask the initial question regarding the meaning of sextortion. Marwa, I understand you've been working on the issue of sextortion for a very long time. Can you please give us some insights into your understanding and experience with the subject? Thank you very much, Farai, for, for the introduction and for bringing this very important subject uh, for discussion. Um, Transparency International has been uh, implementing a pilot project um, over the last 18 months um, in partnership with the International Association of Women Judges and uh, TI's national chapter in Morocco to address the issue of sextortion um, in the context of Morocco. Um, right at the start of the project, um, there was a big scandal in Moroccan media about a professor at the University of Tatuan, who was asking his female students for um, sex or for sexual favors in exchange for passing their exam of university examinations. And we hear these stories again and again of men who abuse their power and authority to extort sexual favors from vulnerable women, not just in Morocco, but as we have seen in the video, elsewhere, almost el everywhere around the world, um, where basically power and vulnerability collide. Um, we've heard stories of, of refugee women from Iraq, uh, from Iraq, Syria and elsewhere who had to give sexual, sexual favors in exchange for uh, food and medicine or even sometimes blankets um, when it's winter time. There is another story in Tanzania where a uh, court clerk forced his women employees to um, sleep with him um, in exchange for getting paid for their um, overtime work. He was HIV positive and so, soon after one woman after the other were falling sick. These are all examples of sextortion where um, there is a demand for sex or sexual favor um, that is a, at the very heart of this uh, corrupt transaction. And Sextortion is a name, is, is a new name, it's a new definition uh, coined by the um, uh, by IAWJ, the International Association of Women Judges. Um, but as you've mentioned, it's a, it's a very old problem that is often gets um, not so much attention. Um, it, and it captures, the, I mean, the term captures two um, important aspects. One is the sexual exploitation and um, the other is the corruption aspect of these abuses. But to have a clear definition of sextortion, there are four um, 
elements to this phenomena. The first is that the perpetrator is someone with a trusted authority. Second, um, that this person abuses the authority by ex exercising uh, it in exchange for personal benefit. Um, and this corruption exchange is very much, this, it's, it, it, the same dynamic applies to bribery. There's a quid pro quo transaction, um, but in exchange for money, there, we're talking about um, sex or sexual favors. Third, um, that as I as I mentioned, it the the type of bribery it, it's a sexual favor, and finally that extortion um, relies on the coercive power of authority rather than uh, physical uh, violence or force. And naming the problem is is very important. And the first the first step. Um, that enable us to to see and address it as part of a, a broader corruption problem. Thank you so much, Mara, for your insights and overview of what sextortion is and the four elements that you have just hi highlighted. Uh, allow me then to invite Elizabeth. Elizabeth, so I'll pass this question to you. How do you interpret the meaning of sextortion and how relevant is it to land governance? Thanks, Farai. Um, that's a good question. So, as we've said, rather than extorting money or bribes from people in return for access to land, with sextortion, um, we're referring directly to the exchange of sex or, or other sexual favours. However, um, as with bribery, it's not always overt or explicit, and it's something that can be implied in the language used by land administrators or land officers or other government officials who are key guardians of access to land through formal channels. Um, and then it also in the language used by male family members who have power over their female relatives' access to land. Um, conceptually, sextortion is very interesting but also very tricky because it is not always explicit. Um, many times throughout history, um, there has been cases of women and sometimes men using sex to gain access to power or resources. Then sometimes the person who is exchanging the sex or sexual favors may actually think that they are doing this as a choice. For example, choosing to use their body to achieve their goal rather than relying on other methods. So the question is, you know, do I follow the correct but time consuming procedures to be allocated land or do I find a way to speed up the process by flirting with the land officer or my brother-in-law or by following that through to sex or other sexual exchange if it seems that would be welcomed. Then if I do this, have I chosen to use my body as the bribe? And does that make me guilty of also being involved in the practice as well? So I think it's important to be clear that we're not talking about rape as such, but a supposed choice that someone would make to offer sex or sexual favors in place of money and in, and in place of walking away and refusing to engage in any form of corruption. But, and this is a big but, what is critical to understand is that for many women and men, there's, there is no such thing as a choice as such. So especially people who are poorer or more vulnerable, and those are oftentimes the people who have the least access to land and natural resources and the most need of it just to survive and feed their children. So another question then that relates to that is then how we distinguish between sextortion and what we might call sexploitation, um, and do we need to? So to give an example, if you have two women, one already has a parcel of land but would like another, and the other has no land, the first woman might be able to wait and follow the correct procedures to be get to to get a second plot, but the other woman might be a poorer woman who's more desperate to get her land and then may be more likely to try to use any advantage she can. So if not money in the form of a bribe because she's poor, then what she has to offer is her body. Um, if the land officer knows that she's more desperate and informs her however implicitly that her application could be speeded up if she were to welcome his advances, a bit like the case we've just seen in the video, then that is very much sextortion from the land officer. But what about where um, a woman is encouraged by others in her family to use whatever means are necessary to secure the land for the family, then is that sexploitation of the woman by her family? Now, this is something um, that even could be joked about within a culture that men would send their wives or daughters off to apply for land because the land officer is known to, to like young and beautiful women. And there's a dangerous borderline between flirting and sex. So in that culture, are the husbands and fathers guilty of sexually exploiting the women in their family to get better and faster land? And 
I raise this because within our Waltz project at Makora, this is something where we found these kind of situations coming up in our research in Mongolia, that things were joked about like this. And then it became very hard to know what was really going on and how the women involved felt about it. So that's just a, a snapshot of some of the kind of conceptual issues, I guess, around sextortion and land governance. Uh, thank you, thank you so much, Elizabeth, for sharing your insights and your experiences. I'm sure your intervention has generated a lot of questions from our attendees. I want to remind everyone to please add any questions that come to mind using the question feature within the webinar system. Once we get to the question session, uh, question and answer session, I'll try my best to make sure that all your questions are answered. But uh, to keep this going, Amani, tell us a bit about your understanding of sex social as a concept and experiences in Tanzania. Yeah, thank you very much, Farai. Um, it is important to understand uh, that this topic of extortion is not, not just relating to land, but to natural resources uh, more widely. It can also apply the respect to access to grazing land, forest resources, or minerals. Um, from our experience in many areas um, where we work, um, rubbles and waste materials from the mining sites are discarded and can be a major source of access for minerals especially for the poor, small scale and artisanal miners who do not have formal licenses to, uh, to mine and to, or to operate. How those West mineral materials are distributed amongst all those who would like to access them is a key point where extortion actually occurs. For example, we found in the world's research uh, that we did with the Mokoro in Tanzania, uh, that the rubble distribution is somehow organized by informal male artisanal mining uh, leaders. There is a scope for the women who, have, who want access to uh, the minerals to use, whatever means they have to ensure favorable access for themselves, which for those who are poor and desperate enough, especially the widows with children to feed, it is not hard to imagine that they, they could see offering sex as a way to get special treatment or protection from all the uh, miners trying to get uh, the rubble. Uh, just to elaborate a little, a bit more on this aspect of succession around access to minerals. In our experience uh, um, at Hakimadini, working amongst um, the uh, mining communities in Tanzania, we've seen it as a norm for influential community members acting as brokers or middlemen based on trust or gentlemen's act, meaning that one could be given minerals to sell in the city, for example, Arusha or Daslam, and then upon selling, pay back the requested amount to the small scale uh, producer. If a woman wants to sell the same products under the same arrangement, they have to give in to sexual demands. This is because they normally have nothing to offer financially apart from, from her body. Furthermore, in some cases, young girls or women are used as bait in um, mineral producing sites, either by their peers or fa fam uh, families. This has been um, uh, touched by uh, Liz uh, before. In both cases, it is assumed normal for a woman to give sexual favors in return of a part of the mineral proceeds. Thank you so much, Amani. I really appreciate you connecting the, the impact of mining and extractive industries and this relationship to sextortion and how this is being experienced in Tanzania. The prevalence of sextortion in this industry is very troubling indeed. Muchanita, what about Zimbabwe? Can you tell us a bit about what you have seen regarding sextortion and land governance? Hello, Muchanita. Hello, thank you, Farai, for the question. I think as already stated by Mawa, the term sextortion was coined by the International Association of Women Judges in an attempt to bring to the fore a form of corruption that is prevalent and old, but sadly it is least talked about, that of using sex as a form of currency in bribe. Um, people in positions of authority and power seek to extort sexual favors in exchange for something that is within their power to grant or withhold. Ultimately, as with any other form of corruption, it involves the abuse of power or authority. In Zimbabwe, as Transparency International Zimbabwe, 
we have been working extensively on land governance issues and what has emerged is that women are often coerced to engage in sexual acts with male persons who have authority to, to access land. Land in Zimbabwe is not only a form of property, but also is also a form of livelihood that's putting women in a vulnerable position. Uh, a number of factors, um, like I said before, place women in a position of vulnerability when it comes to land ownership in Zimbabwe. For example, despite the laws uh, giving equal access and opportunities to inheritance between men and women, we, we see that Zimbabwe is a patriarchal society where generally men own lots of um, the majority of the property and land. And also, I'm sure is uh, I'm not sure if our attendees and panelists are away. There was a land reform program that was done some time in 2000, and uh, from that land reform program, the majority of people benefited were men and not women. Thus, women were put in a vulnerable position. So, as a result of that, if women want access to land, they're often coerced into exchanging uh, sexual favors to get land. A case in point is the video that was played by Farai, the case of Chisumbanji, where Catherine was forced to exchange her body to have an access to land, 0.5 hectares of land for that matter. The case in Chisumbanji is a case where TIZ has been working since the past 20, since 2015. Um, it is a story about a community members who lost their land to a private investor known as Green Fuel. Uh, the investor himself got the land through corrupt related ways. It was, not, it was not transparent how he acquired that land. So in an attempt to resolve a dispute between the community members and the person who was given the land, he offered 0.5 hectares of land to some of the community members, mostly men, and who really did not deserve to get the land. But because women were the vulnerable people, they did not have money, and most of them were poor, single, and unmarried, they were forced to exchange sex in return for land. And like I said before, Zimbabwe is patriarchal. So in instances like this, it is the village heads who actually submit names of those who are supposed to get land. So like Catherine, she was forced now to exchange sex with the village head in order to get a piece of land for her family. Thank you, Farai. Thank you so much, uh, Muchaneta. I'm seeing uh, parallels, I'm seeing similarities uh, in what you have just described and what Amani shared in terms of natural resource governance, women's access to this and where sex, sex, sex extortion comes into play. But let, let's move forward. Uh, and the second question that I have is, what are some of the primary challenges in discussing and in trying to address sex extortion? Elizabeth, what challenges have you experienced in addressing sex extortion? Um, thanks, Farai. I think that one of the biggest challenges is actually in just gathering the evidence um, about sextortion. Uh, what we found very much in our world's research in both Mongolia and Tanzania is that people don't always like to talk directly about these things. So whereas everyone can talk quite openly about bribing and paying money um, to get to be allocated land, there's no shame in that if you're in a situation where everyone seems to be paying for prefer in order to get prefer uh, preferential access to land, or even if there's um, just a situation where people are paying for land through purchasing land or land allocation fees. Um, but we found that there was still seeming to be a lot of shame or taboo about directly talking about paying with sex or with exchange of sexual favors. And whether that was um, people themselves or uh, people talking about whether they would ask their relatives um, to, to do something like that to help the family. Um, on the other hand, we found enough people who are willing to talk about the issues, at least in um, private individual interviews and sometimes also in focus group discussions, um, that we feel confident that sextortion is part of the bigger picture of understanding access to land um, for housing, for farming, for grazing, as well as access to minerals in the communities that we've been working in. And what we had to do was to weigh the evidence very carefully. So looking at who is telling us these things and how credible do we think they are? So is it a trusted and respected community member who's telling us something in private? Then if yes, we would give that a lot of credence, even if no one seems to want to talk much about this publicly or openly. Thanks once more, Elizabeth. Uh, I think it's enlightening to hear that people 
are so readily to accept financial corruption and that sex extortion is seen as so shameful and something that cannot be discussed. It is heartening to hear that you have nonetheless found people willing to discuss these issues, just like Catherine. Amani, what are some of the challenges you're experiencing in Tanzania? Uh, thank you, Farai. Um, one, of, one of the biggest challenges when addressing uh, sex extortion is the nature of relationship between uh, the people, the parties involved, the people involved, which sometimes, because they, they tend to become very close and it becomes more complicated than a relationship, um, a usual relationship between people connected by bribery, extortion, or corruption, as normally discussed. Because of the nature of the sexual, because of the sexual nature of the extortion, sex extortion, and the physical closeness of or intimacy, it could sometimes generate um, a difficulty in, uh, you know, addressing it. Um, where I've been working for year over the years, uh, there are small proportion. Uh, as an example, there are small proportion of uh, normally single and married or divorced or widowed women who get licenses to run uh, mining operations, just like uh, the men, and more especially in gold or gemstones. Um, compared to more usually where it is uh, men who get uh, licenses, but yes, a few women get the licenses. However, even where the women have su uh, sufficient uh, financial power to get their own licenses or engage in mining directly, they usually seek a, a male partner for physical protection and to watch over the operations. In the male, if, if the male partner who manages, it is a male person, partner who manages the mine for her, while the woman is involved in other social and economic responsibilities, taking care of the kids and all that. In return, the male partner assumes, you know, a role of husband beyond the normal um, activities and this is perceived uh, by communities as normal if the woman tries to break away from the husband wife relationship for any reason she may end up losing everything since the property is totally dependent on the influence of the man for its going economic viability and this is a huge challenge um, um, in, in our in our case thank you amani uh, I think what you've just shared with us shows that there's a lot, at, lot a lot at, uh, at stake, especially for single women to enter into business and to have to face extortion and the risk of losing everything without the involvement of a male protector. Marwa, you have spoken earlier on. What are the challenges uh, that you see in addressing sextortion? Well, similar to what um, was said before, uh, one of the biggest biggest challenges in um, addressing extortion is uh, actually recognizing it as a form of corruption. Um, usually it is framed as sexual harassment, sexual exploitation, um, sexual violence and abuse, but it's really rarely that it's framed as a crime of corruption. And that is very problematic um, for a number of reasons. One, it makes it very difficult to capture and collect information and data on the issue especially because uh, corruption is measured in economic or monetary terms. So, uh, for example, if we're talking about bribery surveys that ask people about their experiences paying a bribe to have access to a basic good, it is often um, that these kind of questions don't capture um, the, um, the sexual a sexual bribery or the sexual part of um, of sextortion. So again, we're talking about um, bribery in in very uh, monetary sense, in the in the lack of understanding that actually it can take other forms such as sextortion uh, makes it very difficult for us to understand. Okay, what's the what's the depth and the spread of 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 this phenomena? And the second um, reason why it's problematic is that um, when a crime of extortion is taken down the legal route, so it goes to court, um, for example, the case of the professor I mentioned earlier on, um, it is often ruled or addressed again as an issue of sexual harassment or sexual violence. And we then see discussions about um, uh, consent, uh, of the women uh, who was involved in this crime. Uh, we're talking about um, discussions about why it was instigated, what, what was she wearing, uh, was she giving um, hints to the man, et cetera, et cetera. And these discussions we don't see when we're talking about bribery. 
I mean, there is, we've already established zero tolerance for bribery. So why are we, um, we need to basically establish the same zero tolerance for sextortion and we're not dragged into conversations about, is it rape, was it consensual, um, was she wearing a certain outfit, etc. So the framing is very important and until this point we, we, we haven't established um, sextortion and there isn't enough um, understanding of the issue. Um, as a corruption crime and as a gendered form of corruption. And um, the second challenge we faced in Morocco is actually to encourage women to come forward and speak up. Um, I mean, we, we in Morocco, we have a, a, an advocacy um, and legal center that uh, provides legal help and uh, support for witnesses or, or, or victims of corruption. And we did gender training for that um, center in order to um, be able to receive these cases. However, what we found out is that when dealing with uh, women, we have to um, build trust relationship um, to because of, of of the social, the cultural um, stigma stigma around even so the psychological needs of these women who um, go through uh, crimes such as such as extortion. And so, um, as a next step, we are partnering up with uh, women organizations. In the country, to um, um, who have already listening centers, who have already built trust relationship with with these women, um, in order to tackle this. And the thing is that they do receive these issues. They do come to the centers of women who have experienced extortion, but they they don't know that actually what happened to them is a is a corruption crime and nothing else. Th thank you so much, Marwa. Th thank you for bringing to fore the realities around some of the legal hurdles that uh, victims, as it were, face, whether it's rape, uh, or blame the victim mentality, where they're blamed for what they were wearing, and some of the challenges that uh, women face in reporting this form of corruption. Let's hear from, from, from Zimbabwe, Muchaneta. What are some of the challenges you are facing in trying to address extortion? Thank you, Farai. I think, as alluded to by Laura in the in a in a brief presentation, uh, the biggest challenge borders around the victims of sextortion not wanting to come out or to expose the perpetrators. And I think this is due to what she said: uh, legal barriers which do not recognize sextortion as a form of corruption. It usually it is usually framed around the issue of sexual harassment. Uh, a study which was conducted by TIZ in 2017 revealed that although uh, it revealed that sextortion is the least talked about form of corruption with only 7.7% of the respondents who took part in the research acknowledging its existence. But like what Mawa said, when you do discuss these issues in focus group discussions, that's when you see a lot of women opening up to the issues and acknowledging that it's there and it's happening. Uh, as TIZ, during the study, we also noted that the lack of reporting or the willingness to come forward and report and expose extortion is due to a number of structural disincentives, such as the masculine nature of the reporting institutions itself. You'll recognize that in Zimbabwe, the majority of the police uh, men, I'll say men because they are males, and even where there is a victim-friendly unit, which is usually dedicated to issues to assist victims of uh, sexual crimes and gender-based violence. The police who are man those stations are male. It is still male-dominated. Therefore, in um, for a female to come forward and report, they feel that there is a sense of shame. More so, the people manning those uh, units, they are not really convinced of what sextortion is. They'll treat it as a sexual harassment matter. Uh, another hindrance is the corruption within the legal system itself. Uh, a study we did again as Tazet, we noted that there's a lot of corruption within the judiciary itself, such that a lot of people have lost faith in the judiciary. So they think even if they report the issues of sextortion, it will not be handled accordingly. Therefore, they've lost trust in the system. Uh, the cost of legal aid in itself is a prohibiting factor. Because you see that in Zimbabwe, a case once is put to court, it is not dealt with uh, right there and then come to a, and put to a conclusion. In most instances, the victims or the complainants have to attend court frequently. And the cost of doing that becomes a disincentive to the victim of sextortion. Uh, I think 
like in most cases, the fear of losing what you would have got uh, poses as a hindrance. I'll give an example with Zimbabwe. The communal lands like the ones in Chusumbanji do not come with title deeds or right to ownership, but they're given as part of the traditional lands, such that if you now report extortion that you had to engage in sexual acts or favors with the village yet to get a piece of land, you actually run the risk of um, losing that piece of land. So again, like what Laura said, the stigmatization that the victims encounter, you know, in Zimbabwe, when you report cases of sextortion, you are labeled a, a, a prostitute. Instead of demeaning the perpetrator, you are, you are asked, what did you do to warrant such to yourself instead of rebuking the, the perpetrator? Again, the patriarchal nature of society where, you know, marriage is something that's really valued. If you report, you stand a chance of the family breaking down, your marriage being over. As well as the fact that, you know, anti-corruption activists and gender-based violence activists, they are not really coordinated in their efforts to try to fight sextortion, such that, you know, we've got two voices that are parallel. Although we're trying to fight the same issue, we are not coordinated in the way we're doing our things. So far, those are some of the challenges that you've been experiencing in Zimbabwe as far as trying to uh, kept the issue of sextortion is concerned. So many thanks to you, Muchaneta. Thank you so much for, 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 for such a term, the structural disincentives, the masculine nature of reporting institutions and other uh, disincentives. Uh, I think uh, quickly I'll just share uh, a term that we came across when you're doing a study on young people in corruption. Uh, we students within, within, within academic institutions, they use slang terms like STDs for sexually transmitted degrees to disguise the sextortion element. So thank you, Mucha, and uh, thanks to our panelists. So I'll come on to our final question for the day, which is how then can sextortion be tackled? What is needed to bring sextortion higher on the agenda of land governance and anti-corruption communities? And let me first give this floor to Elizabeth. Elizabeth. Thanks, Farai. Um, I think actually uh, step one, you can call it, is just to get the topic higher on the land and natural resource governance agenda. Um, I mean, really, that's the most important thing. And it's what we're hoping to make a start with through today's webinar, um, you know, to have an open and wide ranging debate on how sextortion can be tackled is is like really important. And, and also to learn from experiences of other sectors who could be further ahead addressing some of these issues that are coming up within land governance. Um, I mentioned earlier that what makes people vulnerable to sextortion is particularly if they're poor or they, they cannot resort to more conventional corruption. They don't have money to pay a bribe, so they're using their bodies instead. Um, so although it won't tackle the broader problem of corruption in land governance, one solution is going to be to tackle poverty, to make people feel less vulnerable to feeling that they have no choice but to use their bodies. Um, although, of course, we don't want them to bribe with money either. So at the same time, we need to tackle corruption in land governance more generally and really try to integrate the whole thing, look at it together. Um, then I also think it's important just to, to add a note that legal change on its own is not necessarily going to be enough. So let's say you provide legally for all widows to get land. That's not necessarily going to take away the problem of sextortion because at the local level of implementation, there, there's still that vulnerability to local officials um, for widows to be able to claim their land rights. Um, and so really what we need to be trying to get at is having more transparency and more inclusivity and more gender equitable participation in land governance at the community level um, to try and, and to raise awareness of sextortion as an issue to try to get to a situation where um, we've, we're making it locally and culturally unacceptable for vulnerable people to be exploited in this way. Thank you so much, uh, Elizabeth. I, I, I like how you mentioned the term vulnerability, where the poor are often vulnerable to sextortion. So in, a, in, an, in addressing this subject today, we're trying to raise awareness and to begin a conversation on how to stop this horrible form of corruption. Amani, what, what are your thoughts based on experiences?
Hello. Hello, Amani. Yeah. Yeah. Um. I, I, yeah. Just echoing what uh, Liz already started. I think there there are no discussions at all about extortion in land or natural resource um, uh, governance. Uh, we need. Um, to start uh, popularizing this concept, to keep it on the top of natural resource um, uh, policy debates, not only leaving it to a discussion around revenues and benefits, but also um, you know the cost uh, that uh, women um, are exposed to and the dangers they're exposed to. A public campaign to break silence on sextortion and to remove um, social stigma from the affected women could be a very good approach too. There is also need for capacity building for authorities uh, who are involved in uh, anti-corruption in our countries uh, because extortion uh, is never in their strategies and for them to uh, take action they need to recognize and understand um, um, what extortion is and uh, you know the challenges in uh, exposing that. This will help, help them in countering the, the problem. Thank you, Amani. Thank, thank you so much. So possibly this webinar can be seen as the beginning of a larger campaign to combat sextortion. Marwa, would like to hear from you on how to get the subject of sextortion on the land governance agenda. Thanks, Farai. We need to talk more about it. And um, this webinar is a perfect example of how we're bringing different communities together to discuss a common issue. Um, Sextortion is a, is a problem that is hidden in, in, a, in plain sight. We know it exists, uh, but we don't talk about it. And when we, talk, when we do talk about it, we're not talking about it in the right framing. And so um, we need to make sextortion part of our anti-corruption discourse and response. It needs to be part of um, uh, our studies, our surveys, um, as part of our anti-corruption strategies and steps that we take in different sectors to combat corruption at large and, and, and uh, sextortion more, more specifically. But un, until we, we do mainstream sextortion as part of corruption, um, we won't be able to combat it the right way. And the second important step is to encourage women um, and men also who experience sextortion to speak out when they are, uh, when they are suffering at, at, at the hands of those who are in, in power because silence contributes as, as um, previously was discussed um, there's a number of issues like stigma shame lack of information about rights mistrust of the justice system fear of retaliation or even reporting mechanism uh, mechanisms or law enforcement um, that are masculine in nature and um, they're not uh, responsive enough uh, or in the proper way to um, women victims of sextortion so unless we pay attention to the ways um, in which uh, people see sexual bribes as different from financial ones, we won't be able to tackle how those differences contribute to impunity and, and victims who are reluctant to come forward um, and perpetrators who excuse their conduct as um, a romantic or, um, you know, kind of a, a socially acceptable in a, in a patriarchal setting. Um, so, I mean, to sum it up, uh, we need to make sextortion a conscious part of our anti-corruption effort um, and this awareness needs to be reflected in our policies and our strategies and our outreach. Um, and I think there's um, more room for building bridges between different communities, between women's rights activists, between, uh, for example, land governance, between anti-corruption activists, um, human rights activists, because I mean, the issue in essence is the same, but it can be tackled from different uh, uh, communities in, in, in different ways. And as I said, again, and I want to stress on this fact that we do need to recognize extortion as a gendered form of corruption. Thank, thank, thank you so much, Mara, for your insights on the many challenges from recognizing extortion as a form of corruption and recognizing power relationships involved in overcoming the shame of it. And more importantly, in creating policies to combat sextortion. I think people would ask if the United Nations Convention Against Corruption makes an attempt to, to, to recognize sextortion. So uh, allow me to invite Muchaneta. What would you say should be part of the strategies in bringing sextortion on the land governance higher agenda? Thank you, Farai. 
Um, I think the same way that human rights activists have joined hands with anti-corruption activists and, try, and uh, are now labeling corruption as a human rights violation, I think it, it is also imperative that uh, as anti-corruption activists and women's rights activists join hands and fight corruption or try to bring it to the fore on a higher scale. Because like I said, we usually were trying to address the same thing but we are running parallel lines. I think there is, great, there is much to be achieved if we join hands with the women's rights activists to address uh, sextortion, not only to bring it to the fore, but also to advocate for it to be a standalone criminal offense. Because from what I've been hearing from other panelists, in most countries it is not recognized as a form of uh, a crime on its own. It is usually housed under gender-based violence or sexual harassment, which poses as a threat when it comes to evidence now, saying it's sexual harassment, the evidence uh, needed or the elements of the crime, they are quite different from what sex situation would entail. Furthermore, I think there's also a need to strengthen our policy makers. Uh, like Amani said, you know, they can only advocate for something that they are aware of. So we need to create researches that bring to the fore the impact of sex situation on, on women. Uh, then train or capacitate our policy makers on how to address and uh, come up with policies that address this form of corruption. As TIZ, we have already started initiatives around this idea where we are now training the Parliamentary Portfolio Committee on Women and other legislators on gendered corruption. So we are hoping that as we continue training for continue training them, um, the issue of sextortion will be advocated at a higher level and policies will be put in place. Most importantly, I think there is need to name and shame the perpetrators of sextortion. So as TIZ, again, we've come up with a training program where we're targeting investigative journalists because we know it's not easy for the women themselves to come out and expose these things. So we've partnered with the media, hoping that they'll they'll encourage more women to report by exposing and shaming the perpetrators of sextortion. We have also noted that uh, women fall victim of sextortion, not only because they are poor, but also they lack information on their land rights. And uh, those in authority and power, they take advantage of this information asymmetry and coerce women into having sexual favors um, in exchange for something that the women are legally entitled to, or they should be provided at no cost. So in this regard, what we have done is Transparency International Zimbabwe. We are conducting community outreaches where we target specifically women and we teach them their land rights. And thereafter, we conduct more by legal aid clinics through our ALAC offices, where now they can report such cases. So I think a lot can be done in addressing um, Sextortion, it's all a matter of collaborative efforts and strengthening the capacity of those who can advocate for a change in law. Thank you, Farai. So thank you so much, Muchaneta, and uh, many thanks to all our panelists for your very insight, insightful responses to these questions. Clearly, I think what's what the picture out there or the picture that you've painted for us is that sextortion is a very serious problem in the land governance sector. I can see that there are several points emerging from this conversation. First is the issue of the acknowledgement and recognition of sextortion as a form of corruption and not to interrelate it or to mix it with gender-based violence or sexual offences. Second is the recognition should be made official in legislation. Uh, this makes sextortion a crime, just like what Muchanita was saying earlier on. Third, in order to tackle sextortion, uh, we need to build the capacity of stakeholders like parliamentarians, uh, caucuses of parliament, and other civil, so civil, civil society actors and communities as well. And finally, I think there's an urgent need to raise awareness of sextortion as a problem, and uh, this webinar is just a beginning. Uh, I like Marwa's submission that we need to bring on board uh, land activists, gender activists, and anti-corruption activists so that we target them and work with them. So I'd like to ask, ask participants attending this webinar if you'd be willing to support any instant declaration in support of these four points. If so, please express your support in, in supporting the chat. We can use this to help build momentum for the issue. Before we move on to the question and answer session, allow me to ask a round of questions to our panelists. So the first question I will throw it to, 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 to Elizabeth. Uh, it's a question coming forward on is it necessary and is it relevant to, to, to relate uh, sextortion and sexual exploitation? Is it relevant? If, if yes, how? Is there a distinction between the two? 
Um, yeah, thanks, Farai. Um, yeah, I mean, I raised that a bit earlier in, in some of the points I was making. I think um, we've defined sextortion as being an abuse of power by authorities um, that relates to sex or sexual favours instead of money or financial um, uh, financial favours, I guess you could call them. And I tried to make a subtle distinction between um, when those authorities are the land administrators or the land officials um, who are having some kind of expectations perhaps about what's needed to speed up the process of uh, being allocated land or just simply what's needed in order to gain access to land compared with the situation of um, family members, so um, perhaps husbands or fathers or other male family members who would then understanding that that was the position of the land administrators and authorities might then try to um, somehow persuade or coerce their female relatives in order to uh, to go along with this. Now, if they have that amount of influence, then you could argue anyway that that is also an abuse of authority within the family. But I think that I just tried to make that distinction because I think there are subtly different types of authority. So one is um, one is family members where relationships are very closely entwined and very complex, and the other is where you actually have government officials or administrators who are abusing their formal authority in that sense. So it's maybe two sides of the same coin, and and maybe we don't need to distinguish about it um, through using different terms. But I think we need to understand that there are subtly different relationships at play and different pressures on um, the victims, if you like, you know, the ones who are ending up having to use their body in ways that they may not be choosing really to do or may not be comfortable with. Th thanks, Elizabeth. Thanks. Mara, you, you, you mentioned earlier on about uh, bringing in um, activists from the land governance sector, gender and uh, anti-corruption. So my, my question to you is, uh, uh, what should what should take first pre precedence? Should you deal with sex situation first, or we address the inequalities in terms of access to land uh, as a means to 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 fighting sex situation? We need to start acknowledging that in the first place is the root of the problem. Or what, what do you think should be done? Uh, what are some of the first steps? Well, I think um, uh, well, I think the fact that there, when we're talking about gender inequality, or not actually gender inequality, but inequality in the sense of uh, not being able to have the same access to basic services, and that can actually be gender blind. So let's hypothetically talk about um, access to water. And those who are able to pay a bribe in order to have a good service that they can, those who can't, and that they are further marginalized and and and. Um, and uh, hurt by by this corrupt act and similarly like extortion i mean hello mara yes sorry so yes so having access to i would like actually to address this question from a different point of view is that so extortion does um, exacerbate the inequality. And of course, um, when, you, when you have vulnerable women, then it makes uh, sextortion uh, flourish. So when we're talking about access to land, um, having inequality in terms of um, that women are not allowed or cannot have access to land unless they give sexual favors to the head of the village or the person responsible from the authorities about land distribution that makes them of course more vulnerable to it but the 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 main uh, the main important aspect is that it makes it worse so extortion makes inequality worse Th thanks Mara. Thank thanks so much. Uh, Muchanita, I wanted to, to, to invite you over. You, you spoke about targeting uh, parliament portfolio committees, uh, like the parliament portfolio committee on, on women affairs. Uh, how have been they responding uh, to this? And have you made an attempt to work with the Anti-Corruption Commission on this issue and the Land Commission? Thank you, Farai. So the parliamentary portfolio on women, they've been receptive 
And um, I think uh, in the next coming weeks, we'll be taking them on a tour to Chisumbanje for them to have an experience of what the women go through themselves. We have also engaged the Zimbabwe Anti-National Corruption Commission with the hope of having a national uh, anti-corruption strategy, which will take into account the gendered forms of corruption. Um, unfortunately, it has come to a halt for, for in the meantime, but it's something that we are working on and hopefully it will produce results because with the, we're hoping that with the national anti-corruption strategy, it will encompass all forms of gendered corruption, including sextortion and uh, create policies that are in line with keeping that form of corruption. Okay, Th thanks, Musha. Th thank you so much. Uh, uh, I want to, to, to throw a question to, to Amani. Uh, one of our attendees says, uh, and I'll read, uh, zero tolerance does not fit for Africa where lands are controlled by families. None can fight against customs directly. And I think the situation can be that of education. So the question is, how do we teach young generation like boys to consider the land rights of females? That's the question to you, Amani. Yeah, th thank you. Thank you very much. I think with, um, <clears throat> with our culture, uh, we need to start uh, educating uh, our kids early enough not to rebel against uh, uh, the culture, but to accept um, the good things and to do away with the with the you know with with the ugly, I would say. Um, and and I think the traditional education system um, at the moment, which is uh, focusing more on uh, uh, on knowledge rather than the values. Uh, is letting us down. So I think from the African context, it's really important to uh, emphasize on, on the value, uh, value system. And this is key because um, knowledge uh, only creates, um, you know, well-schooled people, but not um, uh, cultured uh, in that sense. But also I think we need to also to work with the traditional uh, um, system. Uh, in most of our countries, uh, Tanzania included, uh, we have the traditional uh, leaders uh, who are custodians of our culture, our traditions, uh, which um, uh, you know, you know, which are in 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 ex in, in towards some extent, um, you know, entrenching this extortion uh, and and abuse of women. So we need to educate them also because uh, it is through them that we can change uh, the most uh, difficult patriarchal uh, nature of our, our value system. Th 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 thank you so much. Th thanks, Amani. Uh, Elizabeth, quite interesting that I think we're having a lot of questions uh, around uh, males also experiencing sextortion. One of the questions from our attendees uh, is that it seems as if the webinar only talks is focused on women alone. Uh, is there a gender aspect? If, is there any metadata or empirics on sextortion affecting men as well? Um, yeah, I guess we should apologise for that as panellists if we're giving the impression that this is a um, an issue that is only for women. I mean, I think, the ma you know, majority of cases, probably the victims of sextortion would be women, but um, by all means, it's not only women. Um, and in fact, we tried to get at it a little bit earlier when we are talking about vulnerability and vulnerable people. Um, so what you would find, it's not all women that would be victims of sextortion, it will be more vulnerable women. So we mentioned widows earlier, sometimes female headed, uh, female household heads, but then the same will apply with men. There are always men in any community who are more vulnerable than other men. Um, it could be disabled people, it could be a gay man, uh, a man who for whatever reason did not get married or did not produce children, um, so, you know, there are, there are poor men as well. There are, there are many, many vulnerable people um, and not just men and women. So it's, I think it's very important to keep that. I mean, in terms of um, data and statistics on this, I think that um, we've kind of touched on this a little bit earlier that one of the problems we have is in actually gathering data about it. Um, you know, when corruption surveys are done, sextortion at the moment is not really something that's addressed within that and even on a qualitative level when you're involved in field work at community level it's very hard to um, address uh, you know to address some of those issues so I don't um, I, I think there's work to be done there on trying to 
um, come up with ways in which we can really uh, try to figure out the best way to find out you know, the extent that this is going on and, and to reach out to people to share about their experiences and trying to see how to create the kind of safe spaces where um, all vulnerable people would be open and willing to try to address these issues, to raise awareness about it in order to try, as I said earlier, that we're trying to make this culturally unacceptable that this form of exploitation would continue. Th th thanks, Elizabeth. Uh, so I have, I have a question from Daniel, Daniel Mesh. Uh, he asked the question, where can I read more on the nature and extent of, of the issue? So before I throw this to, 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 to Marwa, I think I will refer him to the TI website, Transparency National website under the land section where there's a working paper on corruption in the land sector. Uh, there's another recent publication on women, land and corruption uh, resources for a resource for practitioners and policymakers. Then there's also uh, this practical guide on gender responsive work on land and corruption. Uh, perhaps, uh, Elizabeth, you can also share some of the sources where some of our attendees can uh, get insights on the nature and extent of the issue. Elizabeth? Yeah, hi Farai. Um, I think that your uh, the sources you've mentioned actually that's a really good place to start. Um, certainly, the TI report is very, um, you know, it's really brought a lot of the issues up to the fore. Um, we've also just uh, recently in Macquarie with our Waltz project, we've now published um, our country reports from our research on Mongolia and Tanzania. And if you read um, if you read those as well, you'll also find some examples of things in there. But I think as a general um, guide to the the issues, maybe more conceptually, I would definitely recommend to take a look at that TI report. Thanks. Hey. Mara, you want to come in? I know you did a blog on that. You want to share some of the sources? Yeah, so um, TI is uh, definitely, um, there is some uh, resources on uh, subscription and also the, the, the links between corruption and gender in general. Um, I would also recommend uh, there's an excellent toolkit prepared by IAWJ, who again named the um, um, named the coined the name sextortion, um, and it, it addresses the definition very clearly. Um, the gives different examples from countries um, about sextortion. It also goes into the legal aspects of the problem and what can be done legally to um, combat the issue. So I would definitely recommend that. It's, I think it's called the Toolkit on Sextortion and you can find it on the IAWJ website. So thanks, Mara. Uh, thanks. Like, like I said earlier on to our attendees, if you go to the TI website, uh, there's a very recent publication on gender responsive work on land and corruption. It profiles what TI has been doing under the Land and Corruption Project. Uh, there, there is this interesting question and I'll read it to our, attend, our panelists. Actually, this topic is very new to me. I came to learn uh, of it of the fifth uh, today. Uh, here in Myanmar, all land, water, and resources are owned by state, and most lands were owned by state, and it was managed by government. Even in, uh, in the smallest unit of governance, the village lands were under management by state, uh, that is the central government. And even in, uh, in one of the families, the owner is men. All of this dealing with land is uh, only with men and village authority. Uh, it's not a question. I think uh, the, 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 the attend is just sharing. Uh, we have uh, uh, Nasei Kisambu, uh, who says, uh, hi, interesting discussion and congratulations to our panelists. My question is directed to Elizabeth Daly. I think uh, our pan he or she is still typing the, the, the question. Uh, there's another question uh, where from Aneti which says, what are sexually transmitted degrees? Uh, sexually transmitted degrees, it's a slang term uh, which is being used in, uh, in institutions of higher learning in Zimbabwe, where a female student normatively gets a passing mark from a male lecturer through consenting to, 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 to sex with the, with the male lecturer. So other students will then term that degree a sexually transmitted uh, uh, degree. So uh, we have another question here from our attendees. The question is, do you have any research that covers land and corruption or it is mostly based in Africa? Uh, I will throw it over to, to, to Muchaneta uh, and also to, to Amani. Do you have any research that covers uh, 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 land and corruption or most of it is based on Africa? Hello, Muchaneta. 
Yes, thank you, Farai. I think you highlighted the research that is available. Uh, TI, Zimbabwe, Zambia, and a few other chapters have been working on land issues in uh, the guide and reports are available on the TI website. Okay. Amani, do you have any studies from that, from that end? Hello, Amani? Hello. Yeah, we 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 don't have we don't have a lot of a lot of studies on uh, land and corruption, but this is um, a work in progress. Uh, we have a uh, Tanzania okay. uh, Land Alliance, which is uh, working on on this on this bit of uh, research. Okay, okay, okay. Um, there is this question, uh, and uh, I will invite Maru again. So if the legislation, uh, the executive and the judicial institutions do fail to acknowledge uh, and address extortion, what can be done at all? Thanks, Farai. Um, what can be done is trying, first of all, to um, to recognize against extortion as part of corruption in legal terms, meaning that if you look at the anti-corruption legislations in place, the anti-bribery legislations, for example, um, it is often, if it's not explicitly referring to money, it can refer to, uh, it can refer to, I'm using some phrase, some words in, um, that we've seen, like are there other advantages? So that the public officials, for example, is, is not allowed to take money um, or bribes or other advantages. The problem here is that when it's not expi explicitly um, recognized the sexual favors as a form of bribery, when we take these cases to court, like as I mentioned in the case of uh, the University of Tatuan, we had discussed with the judges that it didn't occur to them that other advantages a, could include sexual favors. And because there was um, in court, there was no legal precedence. Again, it was not. Uh, it was immediately tackled as a as a sexual harassment issue and, and not as a corruption issue. So, there's a lot of um, reform to be done on the legislative side, especially in the anti-corruption legislations and policies. Um, and I think there's also um, on the um, on the policy side of things, um, it, there's a lot of um, uh, mainstreaming work to be done. So, for example, um, on programs, development programs, or any government initiatives that deal with women empowerment or um, the economic development of women, um, or um, purely corruption initiatives or the national strategies, or, uh, corruption strategies of the country. These can can include be reformed to include and recognize um, extortion as a form of bribery and also um, to also consider that sextortion is an obstacle to the economic and social development of, of these women and therefore it needs to be taken um, uh, on board with, on, with these initiatives. Um, so um, definitely then to summarize reform anti-corruption legislations and also um, to make sextortion as part of the government policies that are target women in the country. Maybe just to add on to that, Farai, I think there's also a need to recognize that everyone has a part and a role to play in exposing and advocating for sextortion um, as part of a crime in enhancing the policy reforms that you're talking about. I think the, the attendee had asked a question, what can be done if the law itself does not recognize sextortion as a crime? So I think um, we all have a, play, a role to play, advocate, policy, talk about it more often, expose it, name it and shame it. Uh, like I said before, strengthen the capacity of those who are in a position to lobby for law reform. And then uh, I think everyone then has a uh, role to play and it can be done. Okay. Thanks, Michanita. So I think finally Naseko did throw the question. So the question is addressed to, to Elizabeth. So Naseko is saying, I agree with you, Elizabeth, uh, all that sex extortion is more related to sexual harassment and gender-based violence. Section 25 of the Prevention and Combating of Corruption Act in Tanzania 
recognized extortion as a form of bribe and a criminal offense. So given their context on land, governance and administration in Tanzania, and specifically the management of the village land, which is said to be 70% of all land in Tanzania, and in consideration of the reported corruption incidences in local government, do you, did you find this form of corruption within the uh, Tanzanian context, Elizabeth? Um, yeah, thanks, Nseku, for the question. Um, I think the issue, well, there's two issues, actually. One, I think, is that there would be a lack of awareness of the law on, on this particular point, and I'm sure that that's one of the things that could be a helpful part of the solution in Tanzania is actually raising awareness that sextortion is legally considered as a form of bribe and criminal offence. Um, but I think the second issue, and maybe the bigger issue that we also we talked about earlier, is how to get people to talk about these things, that the stigma around it, and um, when you're trying to do research on the subjects, people don't always want to talk about it. So, I mean, the short answer is yes, that I think that that is there, and that we have found that sextortion is an issue. Um, and certainly, uh, you know, recently in our Waltz research, but I've, I've been involved in um, a lot of research on land issues in Tanzania going back many, many years. Um, Niseku knows uh, some of it, you know, we've been working on together. And one of the issues is getting people's trust in order to talk about what are difficult and complex things that they don't necessarily want to tell you straight away when you first go in and and meet them or want to start interviewing them. So some of these issues emerge as relationships develop after you can build trust with people, um, sometimes in life history interviews, for example, rather than um, in surveys. Um, but some people do talk about it. And I mentioned earlier about looking at whether influential people in the community are prepared to talk about these issues in private. And I think if you have influential people who know what's going on and who can say, look, honestly, you know, this is happening, that women are are um, using sex to get land, then you would give that a lot of credence. And that is something that we found in our recent research. OK, th th thanks, Elizabeth. So there's an interesting comment from uh, Eliane Wakesho. Uh, Eliane says that I think it's more important to make it clear that women are not vulnerable rather they are pushed to positions of vulnerability. Keen to hear any efforts around protecting women and creating safe spaces for them to speak up and seek redress without fear of victimization. And I think Mar Marwa spoke, spoke at length around that. And I think Marwa, you can, you can come in again uh, and try to answer uh, Elaine, Marwa and Aman. So I'll pass it first to, to Marwa, then I'll come uh, to Aman. Thanks, Farai. I think it's a very important point indeed that um, we don't want to we don't want to frame women here as as solely victims. That like agency or um, you know that extortion only happens to vulnerable women. I mean, if we follow, for example, the Me Too movement in the US or the um, um, the scandals of uh, of uh, what's his name uh, Weinstein, I think or Weinstein, where again it, it, these are women who are have a huge influence their celebrities their actresses with, with with social status with money and with with a lot of influence yet again they are um exposed to sextortion um if you want to get a certain role then you have to to give sexual favors to so and so and that example is to i mean it's 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 remote from our discussion from bland um, governance issues but it again shows that it could happen to the best of us it could happen to highly educated women it could happen to women who are in power. Um, all it takes is just a person who has an authority higher than you um, to abuse that power and to extort a sexual phase from you in exchange for something else. And so in in Morocco, and, and to talk about how we, we try to address this issue without further victimizing women who are already victims of sextortion, um, what we did is, um, we tried to, um, I mean, we, we got a, a gender expert on, on the project from the very start um, to make sure that all of our activities, including outreach activities, um, raising awareness, seminars, um, including the, um, the ALAX, try to make it very gender sensitive to the point that we, A, we are not um, portraying an image of, of, of victims or to try to, um, again, to 
frames extortion as an issue that only happens to women that coming from disadvantaged backgrounds um, and also to try not to re-traumatize women when they decide that they want to speak up about an issue not to uh, re-traumatize them in the process when they decide to come forward um, and that requires again a great deal of, uh, of, of, of gender training and, and, and having um, or exhibiting a, um, a lot of sensitivity um, towards how you receive cases and, and, and try to engage with them without causing unintentionally further damage to, to the to the victim of the crime. And um, uh, there is always, of course, there needs to be safety, there needs to be confidentiality. These are the very two basic um, conditions of our work at these ALAC centers. Um, and as part of that, women should always have the right to decide when they report on extortion, whether they want to go ahead and, and, and pursue the matters legally, for example. So I've heard stories about women deciding to come forward and then after that they retracted their um, complaints because of social pressure, because of psychological pressure, maybe because they are under threat. Whatever the reason is, there we always need to respect um, the course of action that this person decides to take. Whether again to, to push the the um, the issue into into the court or um, to have the issue being used in research or for awareness raising or even to decide to you know join a public campaign and speak up on the issue, which. Um, some did, like the girl who decided to speak up against her professor. Um, she decided not to stay quiet and she went on social media and she used Facebook to say this is what was done and she recorded it. And of course there was a certain, you can expose yourself to certain social blacklash, but for us as um, as STI or as in, in this project specifically, uh, we gave a lot of agency to, to these women to decide how they want to go forward and what kind of help they need. So thank, thanks, Marwa. Amani, uh, how have you been dealing with communities, especially women, in trying to protect them from victimization and encourage them to, to come forward and report? I think uh, it's, it's very interesting that um, even the most powerful and well-educated women uh, could be exposed to uh, sex extortion and even give in to sex extortion. I think it's important to develop uh, support systems and uh, spaces um, where women, uh, individual women, can discuss about um, um, this kind of exploitation and corruption. Uh, because um, even in situation where um, a well-exposed and educated uh, woman uh, finds herself uh, resisting against the entire, you know, a community. Um, Pushing, pushing, or, or even family pushing her towards giving in because they see it as a as a normality, and uh, this is a, a challenge. Um, there's a lot of pressure um, around around individuals, and it's only collective effort and um, uh, awareness uh, and, and confidence build uh, that it can be addressed. So I think it's important to build a uh, support systems because it's not about individual; it's about changing the entire. Uh, value system. Th 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 thanks, Aid. Hey, thanks. Uh, there is a comment from Patricia. It's not a question, really. Uh, Patricia is saying she does agree uh, that uh, women are, uh, due to gender inequalities, are forced into a vulnerable situation uh, with regard to access to land and control and ownership of the latter. So there is need to address that uh, uh, as a means to an end. So uh, thank you so much. Um, many thanks to, to our panelists. Many thanks to Elizabeth, Muchaneta, Marwa, and Amani. Um, I think uh, from this webinar discussion, I think there is convergency uh, amongst our panelists that sextortion is the abuse of power uh, in a manner involving uh, the, the use of sex and sexual benefits as the currency of that corruption transaction. Uh, and I think uh, from, from the webinar discussion, uh, our panelists also converged that women are forced into a situation of vulnerability because they do not have control and access over land. They do not have control and access over capital. So they are forced then to use sex. Uh, Elizabeth brought 
interesting insights into the the, the distinction between uh, sex exploitation and sex uh, sex extortion, as it were. More importantly, uh, I like the submission um, that Elizabeth just shared on uh, one point about the need to get men on board. There is need to work with men as a constituent in a trying to address sex extortion. Uh, I think this webinar discussion uh, brought to 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 four one the issue that sex extortion is not legally recognized in law. And one of the challenges which makes it diff which makes communities to, diff to deal with it is that uh, once you go and report of the time, it is treated as something of a, uh, a sexual harassment or anything of that nature, and not specifically as a form of corruption. Uh, then I think from Muchaneta, um, there the, the is need uh, for, 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 for communities to come together, the community on gender, the community on land rights, the community on anti-corruption, there's need to bring all these communities together. More importantly, I think from this webinar discussion, uh, panelists shared with us that one of the challenges in trying to address sex extortion is the privacy of the issue sex as it were, which I think there is need then to protect uh, victims of sex extortion as, uh, as explained by our esteemed uh, pa pa panelists. So we are coming to the end of um, uh, this, this webinar discussion. And like I said, TI wants to come up with a campaign. So the campaign is centered around one, sex extortion must be acknowledged as a form of corruption. The second thing is the recognition that should be made in official legislation that makes sex extortion a crime. Third, in order to track and to tackle sex extortion, we need to build the capacity of stakeholders who work on that. Again, I'll, 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 I'll recap on the three important points. So the first one is acknowledging sex extortion as a form of corruption and not to treat it as a form of sexual harassment in as much as it is but within the context of corruption sex extortion is a form of corruption just like bribery secondly this recognition should be made official in legislation it should be so explicit in official legislation that this is a form of corruption that needs to be dealt with more importantly, there is need then to build the capacity of stakeholders to do so. So among some of the stakeholders, I think Elizabeth shared with us that we need to consider men. They are part of the constituency whom we need to target. There is also need to target arms of government like the anti-corruption commissions, the land commission, the human rights commission and the gender commission. More importantly, there is also need to build the capacity of policymakers so that they design gender sensitive anti-corruption policies like uh, the parliament portfolio committee on mines or committee on lands and committee on women affairs. So attendees, uh, this is the discussion that we have been having. Uh, on sex extortion. Uh, I know that uh, TI will continue with this conversation uh, using its social media portals like uh, Twitter. I know Mukoro and other land portals, I think they also try to, to keep the discussion ongoing. Uh, this is the end of today's webinar discussion on sex extortion. So before I close it off, I'll round it out to our panelists. I'll start with Elizabeth. What are your last comments, Elizabeth, that you can share with some of our attendees? Um, thanks, Farai. I think that was a great summary of um, the discussion that we've had. And I'm just so pleased that we've managed to have this webinar today and that people have been interested to um, come together and start looking at the issues um, in a kind of integrated way, as you know, we said, with different communities. I think I just want to emphasize that point about, um, you know, we've talked a lot about women, but it is about gender, it's about vulnerable people. And actually, if you look at who the authorities are when it comes to land governance, so, you know, majority of land administrators and officials in most countries are, are men. So we also need to keep men on board. We need to do that by talking about the gender dynamics around this extortion issue and not just make it about women and men. So I think I would just like to finish on, on that point. Thank you very much for um, for inviting us to to be here to be as panelists and and for facilitating that for I. So thanks, Elizabeth. Thanks for stressing the need for including men on that. And I'm happy that my brother Amani is here. He's a man and has taken passionate interest in this subject. Amani, what are your closing remarks? Uh, thank you, Farai. Um, I think this is a very important discussion. At uh, this point, um, it's just the beginning, but I think we need to build a stronger movement around this uh, issue. 
uh, because we've seen it is um, it's starting across different sectors. It's not only land, even beyond land. And uh, yeah, you actually even mentioned about um, sexually transmitted de uh, de uh, degrees, which is a similar. We have a similar uh, term here in Tanzania in Swahili. So I think it's it's important for us to organize and to raise the voices and um, to link um, national and international efforts just to bring more uh, visibility to this. Great work and thank you very much, T.I. and Mokol. Thank, thanks so much, Amani. Thanks so much. Let me bring it closer home. Muchanita, uh, any last, last, last comments before I give it to, 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 to Marwa? Thank you, Farah. It has been truly an insightful webinar. Uh, my last thoughts will be everyone has a role to play in fighting sextortion and bringing to the fore the negative consequences of this form of corruption. There is need to strengthen collaborative efforts because I've heard many panelists saying they're doing great work around that area. Maybe there's also need for a regional focus and international focus as well. We will put collaborative efforts in trying to, to end sextortion. Thank you. Thanks, Mucha. Marwa, from, from North Africa and based on your experiences in Morocco, you shared quite insightful issues. Any last comments? Thank you, Farai, very much for facilitating the discussion. And um, I'm really very happy that we're having this conversation. And I, I think this is um, now we're seeing more and more and more conversations about extortion. And, and my hope is that um, just like corruption has become um, unaccepted, um around the world and bribery is being criminalized around the world which wasn't it wasn't the issue a few decades ago it was uh, seen as the normal way of doing business i do hope that sextortion will be um very soon um treated the same way as that there's there's zero corrupt or zero tolerance towards um, sextortion and regarding i mean uh, and, and not going into the gray zones of of, of framing uh you know framing it as sexual harassment or sexual abuse and um going into the discussions of uh, uh these power dynamics uh, i i do hope also that we see that reflected these conversations to be um reflected in international conventions indeed like the the uncag agreement that um there is a recognition of um of sextortion is, is a form of, of corruption. This is These are very important conversations and uh, they make us more aware about these kinds of crimes and raises more awareness about the issue. And um, I hope it does encourage people to, um, especially victims of sextortion, to recognize it also as such and to be able to come forward and use existing reporting mechanisms for to, to end the impunity of these perpetrators. So thank, thank you so much. Th th thanks, Marwa. Thanks. Thank, thank you so much. And many thanks to our attendees. Many thanks to Patricia. Many thanks to Anita.